Hey everybody, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And this is all to provide education and inspiration for all of us, really any entrepreneur, but especially the event industry professionals and consumers. And there is quite a back catalog now. If you all haven't gone back, if you're somewhat new to the show or either way, there is so much in the library now. I mean, we're talking about Mindy Weiss, David Beam, Tara Gerard, Lynn Easton, Darcy Miller, Mindy Rice, Jose Villa, Ron Ben Israel. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And some incredible consultants as well, which is really interesting. I like to kind of mix it up on the show. And if you go back, you'll find Simon T. Bailey and Sean Lowe and Cindy Novotny and a very special episode with Brett Culp. And so be sure to check out the archive, the back catalog. I think you'll be surprised and have a lot of fun with it. So if you missed last week's episode, it was part two with Colin Cowie. I'm sure you know who he is, but just in case you don't, some of his private clients include Oprah, Elton John, Nicole Kidman, Michael Jordan, Jennifer Aniston, Kim Kardashian, and Tom Cruise. You don't want to miss it. That was last week. And I want to announce this week's special guest, who is Natasha Miller. She is in the events and entertainment industry, which is, of course, especially close to my heart since I founded my own music and entertainment company. And so Natasha is out of San Francisco. That's where I went to visit her. She became a music talent booking agent at the age of 15. She started Entire Productions in 2001, an event and entertainment production company designing and producing full-scale events with an emphasis on what she calls experience design. She has received a lot of awards, including the honor of being on the Entrepreneur 360 list for 2018, which celebrates small businesses mastering the art and science of growing a business as measured on impact, innovation, growth, leadership, and business valuation. She was also listed in the San Francisco Business Times Fast 100 as one of the fastest growing companies in the San Francisco Bay Area. And be sure to check out the next level, which comes out in a couple days on Wednesday, in which I have a guest co-host. And I, we tease out some of the highlights of the interview to help break them down and deliver specific tactics and tips to help you raise your business to the next level. And I'm excited to say that this week's guest co-host on the next level is Shannon Leahy, a wonderful planner and designer out of San Francisco. So enjoy my conversation with Natasha Miller. So Natasha, thank you for being on the show. I'm so excited to be here in San Francisco to interview you. Very good to have you. Thank you for flying across the country in the polar vortex. Yes, it's extremely cold. I can't get over it. But, you know, I notice when I met you the first time last year and even now, and I come into your office, you have your staff. Everyone has such a youthful, vibrant kind of an energy. I love that. I would say thank you, except for I think they are youthful and they are vibrant. (laughs) (laughs) Just by nature? Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. We hire only great people. So thank you Yeah, for noticing. No, everyone's really friendly. I definitely notice it. So, you know, I remember when we first met, you were telling me, I'm going to dive right in with this. Hit it. About how you had a really challenging, challenging childhood and that what you've survived and even thrived from, you know, and I have an experience too that I had uh, way back when. And it's not just surviving it. It is thriving in spite of it, you know, and somehow being positive. And you talk about how you're writing a memoir Are you able to tell me anything about this, you know, and how it affected you? I will tell you what I can without giving away the whole story plot. But, you know, as I've been writing this memoir and talking about my life with other people, I've noticed that so many people, of course, have their own story. So many people have had inflection points in their lives that are as important to them as the ones that seem to me to be so big to myself. So I don't find myself a very unusual person with some of these things now that I've been sharing them with other people. However, I have been on my own since I was 16. And actually, funny enough, last night I was watching an episode of the show called Sex Education. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. And I really, I enjoyed the show, but one of the characters said to her son, you're 16, you're not supposed to know anything. And I literally just started crying yesterday. I don't really cry that much. And it really hit me that I've been bearing the burden of an adult life for a long, long time. And 
even at this age, I look back on it with some sorrow, but it also definitely supercharges everything that I do. I think it's responsible for a lot of what I've accomplished and the successes that I've had. And if I didn't have the experiences I had as a young person, I think I would have a much different life. Better in some ways, but much different. I probably wouldn't have branched out and did as much. Well, and when you said supercharge, what do you mean by that? You know, I'm always proving to myself, but before, you know, when people would say to me, like in high school, my counselors, after I graduated, saw me and said, oh, you're doing pretty good. We thought that you might be dead in a gutter. And I thought, really? This is what people are thinking of me. And the reality is I was concert master of the symphony in high school. I didn't drink or do drugs. I was a little bit on the nerdy side. I wasn't, you know, out gallivanting about town, but the reason of being sort of abandoned by my family and living on my own was enough for them to say, it's never going to make it. Yeah. Well, so what do you think it is about your character, your personality or constitution that at such a young age at 16 and having that experience enabled you to be able to go out there and basically surprise everybody who didn't think you'd even live through? I definitely was going to prove every single human being on the planet that thought that I wasn't going to be anything wrong. And I have certainly done that. I've surpassed all expectations for myself. And now I realize that I've, you know, surpassed so many goals, how much more there is out there to go after. Mm. So you, in a way you felt like it was enough, it sounds like, just to make the essentials work for you. And you're saying there's so much more even than that. Well, I mean, essentials, boy, I didn't have essentials a lot. Certainly didn't have emotional essentials growing up, which is way worse than any kind of physical abuse, in my opinion, in my lens, through my lens. But, you know, I got a full ride scholarship to college, but I had no support. My family didn't help me fill out applications. They didn't suggest that I go to college. Even my high school counselors didn't look at me as a potential college-bound person. And again, I struggled to understand looking back why that was, but I didn't do well academically because I was too busy trying to survive. And however, I was an excellent violinist. So I poured all of my time and energy in that. So that took me to a full ride scholarship to college, which led me to the next thing. Wow. So the love of music was like an emotional blanket in a oh, way for you. For sure. Practicing the violin for hours gave me something to focus on. You can't really think about your woes when you're playing. Your mind is reading music or it's doing scales and arpeggios. It keeps you company. And also, you know, I remember practicing in my bedroom with the window open because I wanted the people on the street, my neighborhood, to know that I had value. Wow. And through the music, it seems to me that must be where you also got your sense of discipline and organization was through that. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. So I started studying with a college professor, Dr. Beale, at Drake University when I was in seventh or eighth grade. There was so much pressure to perform. So I would skip class to practice. So I was practicing about six hours a day. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. at, in your teens, you're talking yes. about. Mm -hmm. So the drive that you had, it all went there. When I was given the opportunity by my conductor to meet this professor. To me, it was like meeting God. And I was terrified, right? There was too much responsibility for me. It's not like my life had built up all these gradual responsibilities. And then meeting Dr. Beale, the professor was like a natural segue. I went from basically zero to a hundred when given that opportunity. So he became a mentor for you? Mm -hmm. He did. Yeah. And this emotional support you had been missing in a sense. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad that you're leading me to this because Dr. Beale was known at Drake to be sort of a hardball. So all of his students were scared of him. And he would play like the Bach double with me on his violin and he never played with anyone else. People would look at me like, why is he bothering with this young girl? Like, And then he'd walk me to the candy machine in the hallway after and buy me a piece of candy. And everyone was like, what is going on? This mean professor is being so sweet to this young gal. Well, and at that age, from what I read about you, is that you're a violinist and a jazz vocalist, and you became a booking agent at 15? 
Well, I mean, yes, I did. I was doing the work of a booking agent at that age. I didn't know it was called that. I also didn't know there was a word called entrepreneur, which probably happened, got in fashion later. But I was playing with my string quartet and then people would want to book me on a night. Maybe I was playing for something else. And instead of turning down their request, I couldn't really, I couldn't afford to. I couldn't afford to say no. No, sorry, I'm already booked. I had to say oh, actually, I'm booked, but I'll bring in another group that's as good as I am and probably better and but manage Natasha, it. Natasha, at 15, 16, mm-hmm. that is something not many kids would think of. I mean, they would just say, oh, I can't. I don't think, exactly. I don't know that it would occur to them. <laughs> no, I think it was out of necessity. Well, I really do. And maybe you've I got had, the spirit, the un- maybe entrepreneurial had a little spirit. business acumen. I'm not sure I would have been as entrepreneurial as I am had I had a different upbringing. I really don't. But We'll never know. Well, you had to, like you say, survive. So what I read was that you started hiring out your teachers and professors. Is that right? Yeah. And they thought it was cute. Yeah. For the first couple times. And they started getting miffed that their regular bookings through the symphony office were really kind of diminishing and it was their student that was requesting their availability. That is funny. So how, I mean, I could almost guess, but is this basically what then kind of flowed and evolved into what you have now, entire entertainment? We'll get to more in a minute, but did it kind of flow from there into expanding and expanding? It did, but I never thought that I would have this business. I thought I would just be a performer. And yes, I was sending out other talent back in the day, but I wasn't thinking I'm going to build an empire and have this amazing big company, multi-million dollar, you know, in various locations. Never occurred to me until my daughter was about five. And then still my inclination was to be a performing artist. So my heart and soul was in singing and songwriting and performing on the stage in that way. Violin was a way to sort of get me up there to that point. And it was a good living, actually. I could make $300 an hour playing the violin, which as a young... As opposed to minimum wage of correct. your friends. Yes, right. So it was a very organic, natural, and quite slow process of building this business. For the first 10 years, it was just me. I was a sole proprietor. I had some interns. I had some part-time people, but very low overhead. And I learned that being frugal in business and having low overhead was very important. I learned that in an ad agency that I worked at before. And so I kind of run the business still, you know, in that way and don't spend where we don't have to. And pretty conservative in that manner. You know, that's interesting because a lot of creative people, you know, like in all aspects of the event business, for example, don't really have necessarily the business acumen well, or the successful ones had to build it and evolve it. And like, I remember talking to Harmony Walton about operating during the recession on, as she said, bootstrapping, mm-hmm. but she still bootstraps mm-hmm. no, no matter how much revenue is coming in. Yep. She still bootstraps, she said, and that's what you're talking about too. Yeah. I just make sure that everything that's coming in covers everything that's got to go out. And then some we're not taking, you know, any kind of capital from outside sources. So, but I didn't really know that that's how businesses worked. So this was just natural for you. Yeah. So, and I know that I read somewhere too, you know, in terms of this part of your life where you're sole proprietor, you're doing it yourself, that something like for six months, you wouldn't let any employees as you did bring them on talk (laughs) to clients. Yeah, I really thought that the clients needed to hear from me, that they needed to talk to me who, quote unquote, knew everything. So as a violinist and as a vocalist, as a person that plays the guitar and the piano that's been in a band that knows how to run lines to a PA system, like I know the lingo, I know the language. And I thought that unless you didn't, you shouldn't be interacting with our clients. Well, that's not necessarily so because I'm training now my employees this language and they don't need to know it to the degree I know it. Just that someone does and that someone is me in this organization is really all that's needed. Also, I had so much information in my mind and I hadn't put it down into systems and processes, which we now have. So yes, it was silly of me to wait that long because when I saw how amazing this employee was at doing the work and talking with clients, I was like, oh, that's amazing. And just learned how to be a better delegator. But that's still a big leap, it seems, not only delegating, but also, and a lot of us are struggling with this, to really trust the employee 
yet keep an eye out? I mean, you didn't bury your head in the sand at this point, did you? No, 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 no. No, I trained her and I really supported her. And then I let her shine and let her, you know, make some mistakes. And the only thing I wasn't doing was being overbearing and micromanaging. How do you keep yourself from doing that? You know, right now with the team I have, I'm armed with a lot more information about how to hire and how to onboard and train people. Back when I had that first employee, I didn't know anything. So had I been armed with that information, I would have let her engage a lot earlier. Anyway, how to trust people. You really find out during the interview process, the reference process, the information that you exchange with this potential employee. You can tell if somebody is going to be trustworthy. Also, they're signing documents of non-compete and non-disclosure. Which you are liable for. Yeah. Yeah. So... They come to work knowing these are the expectations for you to work here. If you want to work here, great. If you you know, disagree with some of them, let's have a conversation. And if we don't come to terms, then it's not probably the right place for you. Well, and also you talked about hiring people who could even represent your brand to the public. That's what I'm saying in terms mm-hmm. of having them go out, market and network. Yeah. And I mean, that's a whole nother big step. It is, but that was gradual and natural as well. I was there a lot for the marketing and networking. As we grew, then I actually teach my team, especially the younger people, what's expected of them at a networking or marketing situation. What is must do? What is don't you dare do? (laughs) And there's, of course, gray area in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been recognized for this too. I mean, I found a couple different, really very cool awards like Entrepreneur 360 2018 list. And they chose your company based on, as it said, small business mastering the art and science of growing a business and measuring on impact, innovation, growth, leadership, and business valuation. That's an awful lot. Like, can you tell me more it's about so that? Cool. How do you feel that you qualified for that? Well, I think, first of all, that Entrepreneur 360 Award is really amazing because it's not looking just at revenue or growth, which a lot of other sort of contests are doing, which is wonderful too. But to be recognized for those five elements, along with being recognized for the revenue, I just felt full circle. And it really was saying to me, you're doing an excellent job at creating an incredible business but also jobs for your employees, the culture for the employees, the jobs for the talent and the artists. If we don't keep them employed, we're not going to have people to enjoy the arts. Also giving the client an excellent situation and also making them look amazing to their bosses and colleagues and such. So what we do for a living is all pretty much really positive. It's not saving lives per se, but it's really making lives better. I want to take a moment to say that if you've listened to my first interviews of Lynn Easton, Tara Garrard, and Colin Cowie, then you would have heard them talking about the value of hiring a PR company and even early in the process. Well, there's an award-winning publicity company that actually focuses on the wedding and events industry, and I'm talking about OFD Consulting. OFD Consulting has placed clients in numerous popular online and print publications, including the New York Times, Martha Stewart Weddings, Style Me Pretty, and many others. And their client portfolio ranges from top planners and venues to respected national brands and industry thought leaders. Go to OFDConsulting.com to learn more. Again, that's OFDConsulting.com. Well, I love too that you call it, like I have this thing with my own music business, I call it entertainment design, Mm -hmm. you know, all about creating this experience. And I love how you phrase it, experience design. Mm -hmm. And your people are experienced designers. Can you Mm -hmm. say something more about that? I love that. Yeah, so there's a layer that is parallel to designing an event, planning an event. And the experience design takes it from thinking about the event way before people hear about it and figuring out how they hear about it and how they feel. And then what are the touch points that they enjoy and they endure at an event and then how it stays with them and how you can design an event to stay with them long past it's over. 
Of course, you're probably thinking and listeners may be thinking, oh, of course, Instagram, social media lives on, but really we're looking at developing a feeling so that when, you know, they turn to the right and they smell, you know, a waft of jasmine or lavender, let's say, for some reason that might trigger them to remember the event that we designed for them and then have a wonderful memory about it. And of course... We want people to remember us so that they're coming back to us for repeat business, of course, only if they loved what we do. But in any event, the experience design is sort of another hierarchical level of thinking. Can you walk me through an example of one that you really love that sticks with you, even if you don't, if you're not able to get the name of the client, but from like start to finish, I would love to hear your process. Wow. I'm thinking of a big one that we did just in December for 6,000 people in 20 different rooms at the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose. But for that event, we were not able to reach all of the clients and the party growers ahead of time. We did what we would call a partial production. So they had already gotten the venue. They're the ones who are disseminating the information about the invite. So I'll bring you back to our annual marketing event where we really have control every point of reference. So last year, the theme was Vernal Equinox, which is very different. And we had to explain to people what the heck vernal equinox meant and we did that with this really beautiful moody dark video uh, that included a poem and really got people set up and excited for this was just the save the date video oh that's fantastic (laughs) right up front you're creating a so people are like wait what is going on Mm. so we are instilling this curiosity Mm -hmm. Right? That's exactly what people want. They don't want to just be told slam over the head. This is what to expect. Well, and it's building anticipation. Right. And we're known for doing this event every year. So people tend to come out of this event and say, how on earth can you outdo yourself next year? And then I think, oh, God, I don't know if I can. (laughs) But every year we're able to do it, thankfully. And I think to be in this business, you have to be able to reinvent yourself. So the touch point then after that was the invitation. We only allow people to RSVP as a single person. So you can't bring like your brother or your cousin or your wife unless they're in the event industry because we really want to support our sponsors. Hundreds of thousands of dollar retail event. And so we need to make sure that we're really honoring our sponsors by bringing them quality leads, right? So that actually is an experiential touch point because people are like, oh my God, this is so exclusive. exclusive, I can't bring anyone. Like I work at enter, you know, yeah. big company here and they're not letting me bring a plus one <laughs> and no, we'll let you bring them, but they have to be in the business. And then every touch point throughout that event was on theme with touch and feel and activity. And then it lives on forever with giveaways and of course, social media. But because we have this event every year, it's the cyclical thing. So it lives on forever. And we'll use some of them touch points in the photos and the videos from last year to get people revved up for this year. Yeah. So it's kind of a cross pattern. You know, and there's a lot of complexities inherent in what you're talking about. And there's a quote here. It makes me think of that you said, (laughs) and I don't remember where I saw it. I wish I could give uh, credit for it. But you said there are just too many moving parts, too many vendors, too many things to try to manipulate to go perfectly. And there is no such thing as perfect. There's only excellent execution and problem solving. What about that aspect of what you do? I absolutely agree with that quote that I gave. (laughs) I'm not sure where that was, but I think... You know, I tell my team on any big event, something, one major thing is going to go wrong. You will not know what it is until you hit the ground. But if we have prepared eloquently and excellently leading up to it, then we're going to have the time and the bandwidth to address it on site. So for large events that we produce, we really recommend to our clients that they have no major changes two weeks out. Right. If we're talking about the wedding business, does that ever happen? Never. And you know what I want to really impart on everyone, whether it's brides or mother of the brides or wedding planners, is that you're doing your event a disservice by allowing moving parts to happen two weeks prior to the event, right up to the day of. I know it's a very emotional thing, but it is really shooting yourself in the foot when you make those changes. One small change can affect 45 different vendors, potentially. 
And I like how you said earlier, I mean, something is going to go wrong mm-hmm. at every event. I think that's part of what differentiates one from another, regardless mm-hmm. of the aspect of the event industry, is how do they handle it in the moment? You know, how do they improvise it? Not only how do you prepare <laughs> ahead of time, because yeah. we can't prepare for everything. Well, here's the deal with preparing ahead of time. If you have all the essentials complete, done, signed, sealed, delivered, the timeline's done, then you're not in the moment when the X goes wrong you really have time for it to unfold and to think about what the options are to address it. If you are still fielding event changes from the day before or that morning, your brain is busy. It is not able to function, you know, with the emergency. So we always kind of like giggle and we're like, what's it going to be this time? What's the big, you know, and we've always solved the problem and we've solved it without getting crazy or yelling or, you know, stomping our feet. There's no point in that. So yeah. it's a good challenge to have. Well, also you are dealing with so many events. I think you said you did uh, 750 last year. Is that right? I'm going to tell you the number. It is a real number. Yeah. I didn't make it up. I didn't round up. I didn't round down. 777 events last year. And how many employees do you have? 14. How? Are you doing this? And two only in operations. Oh, my God. I mean, no matter how perfect of a process you have. And also, Natasha, I find you to generally be very relaxed. You yes, know, I am. Yet you're not working, you know, 18 <laughs> hours a day. Nope. How can you pull off so many? I don't get it. How are you doing it? It does seem impossible. And I know exactly how we're doing it. So in 2012, I started developing a system within Salesforce to house all of our systems and processes. At that time, I still did not expect to grow like we have. This is, was not done so that we could grow and scale. It was just done because it made sense. And now we're collecting information, the same exact information for every event, the most crucial information. We all know what it is in the event world. And then we make sure that there's an answer for it. So our system is very automated, but also we have a lot of hands touching it as well. But I like to say that, like, I'll give you an example, Andy, if you have an event in two months and my team two weeks before went on a vacation in the Bermuda Triangle and was lost at sea, your event would go off pretty much without a hitch because you get as a client in advance from our system about two weeks before you are able to say, yes, I approve. This is all correct. Or no, I don't. Here are the changes I need to make. Our system then collects that. No human being has to do anything. Then four days before the event, that information is sent out to each artist automatically. So nobody is pushing send. Nobody's opening a compose and writing an email. So that's why we can have, last year, I think we did 137 events in December. So if you think about that times how many vendor, partner, musicians, it's the system. Incredible in one month. Actually, yeah. And I'm thinking to myself right now, it is amazing. And every week we're able to tweak it to our advantage. So if someone's working in our Salesforce environment, and they find themselves doing something repeatedly manually, they are very much encouraged to let us know that they're doing this one thing manually over and over, and we fix then it. And so you can automate and it. We, yeah. And a lot of people are stagnant with their processes. There's nothing stagnant about us. So you're constantly innovating, creating, like the software you have in Salesforce was kind of custom Yeah, I designed it custom. Mm -hmm. And I've been told that maybe I should license it, but it's not a business model that I'm interested in getting into as a business. I do mentor and advise other business owners, but I can tell you not many people take me up on this idea because they think A, it's too expensive or B, um, they're not big enough or C, this is really important that their current employees would never adapt to it. Well guess what? They're all missing out. Yeah. Right. Well, and the rate at which you're growing, San Francisco Business Times Fast 100 chose your company as, as they say, one of the fastest growing companies in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that you had, let's see, 166 percent increase in growth in revenue over the three fiscal years of 2015 to 2017. Mm -hmm. And I imagine you grew in 2018. Correct. Yeah. And you're planning to grow in 2019. You told me some big numbers you're going for. Yeah. 
is there some particular way you can describe that you are able to maintain? Is it because of the automated system and the processes? Is that where you give most of the responsibility to is there in terms of how you're able to grow so fast? That's where the volume is able to be managed. The reason why we're growing so fast is because of our people. And so not just, well, starting with my team, they're amazing. They're creative. They have a fire burning in their stomach for sales and for getting the deal. They're great at designing. There's a little bit of like adrenaline, like, you know, hits every time something happens. Um, and then our talent is excellent. And because of our systems and processes being so, you know, ingrained in everything we do, things really do go off without a hitch and people are coming back. They're loyal to us. We're getting clients that we're not even seeking that see us on social media and they're like, we need you to do this for us. And we're very excited about that. Well, also, you know, we were talking earlier and I love it that you have the courage to say that you want to do less events, earn more, you know, in the same amount of time and effort, which of course we all do. But that takes a certain amount of courage. Are you just taking kind of a leap of faith that, Listen, that energy will get you the bigger yeah. stuff? It's a new thought for me <laughs> in the last year and a half. Since if you think about how I grew up and what I endured, I am not one to turn down business. You need a flautist to play for 20 minutes at a funeral. I will book that for you. Really, I can't do that anymore. So we're really not able to be working with the smaller clients, with the smaller budgets. It doesn't pencil out and it doesn't allow for our growth. So we're looking at doing more larger scale events with you know bigger companies, working smarter, not harder. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get the word out? I mean, obviously there's these legacy clients, word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Are you utilizing, you know, social media and all of that? Is that a big yeah, deal we for are. you? We don't do any paid social advertising, nor do we have paid SEO. It's something that I'm going to look at in the future. Mm-hmm. I'm amazed at when large corporations find us and they say, oh, we found you on Google. I literally said to one recently, but we don't really come up in the first page. She goes, no, you didn't. You came up on the second page. But you looked so much more amazing than everyone else. But how so? Why do you think that is? I think our website, forward-facing to potential clients, shows our electricity and our youthful exuberance. I think so. And compared to some of our competitors who look a little older or more staid, maybe they're not as progressive. Maybe they're not changing with the times fast enough. I can't tell you exactly what this particular person said. She just said something simply. We do attend religiously and participate in MPI and ILEA and PCMA and all of the wonderful event organizations. We're on the committees, we're on the boards. And so that is probably a really big chunk of how we're getting the word out about Mm -hmm. what we do. You know, you talk about also changing, you know, keep it up. The rate of change now is so fast. So you've been doing this for how many years, Natasha, since you... My first business license was 19 years ago. So two questions. How have you seen the music and entertainment industry grow within the context of events and this super fast rate pace of change? Mm -hmm. Well, events have changed, which has allowed for a lot more artists to be involved. So in the Bay Area, which is where we're sitting, there's a lot happening here for special events. There's a huge need for entertainment. So people here are always busy, just plain and simple. And I think experiential marketing events are really taking over from paid advertising, such as yellow pages, magazine, newspaper, television ads. People are now doing experiential marketing events for their product and their service. So that of course loops They've in caught up with you. entertainment <laughs> yeah. and talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then for the changes going on. So, I mean, really technology is changing so fast, but it's feeding right into the, everything else we're talking about. It's enabling this budget for these events, both for internal facing and external facing. So it's this perfect storm. Wow. Well, Where do you see yourself going, let's say in five years, 10 years? Are you thinking that far ahead? You know, we're planning on growing this year by about 28%, but then we have 65% for the following year and the following year. Oh my God. You're setting such high expectations. We've done it though in the past. (laughs) 
And last year was, you know, an interesting year because I was able to stop working on in the business every day. So I was working on anywhere from 40 to 60 RFPs a day. That was in my pot. Yeah, that's how the rest of the team. Right now we have over 200 live RFPs in our system. So I am no longer doing as much of that. And I'm really working on the business and strategizing. But last year, there was definitely some time of transition. So we didn't have the growth last year in revenue, but we had the growth in so many other places that's going to set us up for incredible fast growth again. Our goal this year is actually pretty minimal and we'll surpass it. Which is what percent again? 28% is minimal. I want to get that out. So, you know, before we wrap up, how, you know, again, the way you seem so calm, I mean, the numbers you're throwing out at me, I'd be just like on the edge of my seat the whole time. I mean, you've talked about, you know, childhood, what you've overcome and dealing with challenges and the Mm -hmm. pressure, the self-imposed pressure, yet you don't seem to be jittery about it. You seem so comfortable. I won't do that to myself. I really tried to lead a stress-free life. And I rely on my team to do their job so that I don't have to worry about their jobs. Yeah, I don't need that anymore in my life. I survived a strange upbringing that was full of fear and unknowing, a lot of stress, a lot of really bad stuff. And I refuse to live like that anymore. So the last seven or so years have been really great in that respect. And I've learned how to you know, breathe deeply, problem solve calmly, know that there is an end to the situation that will hopefully be positive on my side. Because I really look at all sides when challenges arise. But yeah, no, I really am literally pretty laid back now. (laughs) My God, that I am so impressed. Well, what is the best way for people to be able to find out more about you? About me or the business? Well, both. <laughs> well, let's say the business. Website, okay, right. social media handle. So you can find us at entireproductions.com. We're at Entire Productions on Instagram. And you can find us on Facebook as well. Those are our main portals. We're a little bit on Twitter, but this industry is not so Twitter focused. Yeah, not as much. And you say you're working on your memoir. Yes. So I've written about 50,000 words. We're pitching it to book agents now who will then turn around and sell it to a publisher, hopefully. I'm unsure of the process. It's, you know, it's very vulnerable place to be. I was going to ask. I mean, now you're talking about getting your story out in public. How do you feel about that? You know, there's a part of me that knows that it could be helpful to people that have been in similar situations. Of course, it's an ego thing, right? I mean, you can't not admit, you know, an ego thing to put your life's memoir out for other people to read. Why don't I just keep it as a journal entry? Or why don't I just keep it as, you know, a historical document for my family? So I just have to be honest and say, yes, it's an ego thing, but also it can be helpful to other people. And I've seen now that I've slowly been telling people my story when it's relevant, right? So I don't just sit someone down and say, hey, this is it. The look on their faces and then the responses to me have been very impactful. So it it tells me that eventually when I feel comfortable enough to let this go be published, It'll be a good decision. You know, not have, every one of us has something. I mean, maybe some on surface is, seems more intense than others, but I feel like every single person has stuff, you know, and to know that to be, I do think it's a gift. You talk about ego, but I think it's a great gift to share something, be that vulnerable of yourself so people can see that, you know what, not only can you survive again, I like the word thrive, not just survive, but thrive from it too. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I've rewritten my history and for people that have had not a great life. I remember at certain points in my life, just looking for any kind of hope, anything to save me. And if I am going to be the person that, you know, pluck somebody out of the darkness for even a moment to consider that there's so much to live for. Great. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing this part of your story. And when your memoir is out, I'm going to be one of the first people (laughs) to go pick that thing up. Thank you. So thanks, Natasha. Thanks for being on the show. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Natasha Miller. Be sure to check out her site 
at entireproductions.com. Her social media handles on Instagram is Entire Productions, and on Facebook, it's Entire Productions Experience. You can always go to the show notes and check out our website at theweddingbiz.com to get all of that and a lot more. And be sure to share this with your friends and colleagues so that they can find us. And also, don't forget to check out the Next Level episode on Wednesday that goes with this, in which I have my guest co-host, Shannon Leahy, discussing the highlights of the interview with me. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And to the podcast, you'll get notifications. And follow us on Instagram at Wedding Biz Show. Again, Wedding Biz Show. We want to thank our sponsors, Kushner Entertainment and OFD Consulting. And we'll catch you next week on The Wedding Biz. Wedding Biz.